Hi and welcome to something a little different from Mrs Ibrooks where we are recording inside the museum at New Edmonton House and I'm joined by Michael McEwen. Thanks very much for joining us today, Michael. Pleasure. Um, Michael is the current deputy editor of Bunkered and the author of Running the Smoke, first-hand accounts of tackling the London Marathon, The Ghosts of Cathkin Park, The Inside Story of Third Lanark's Demise, both Amazon number one bestsellers, <laughs> I was told to put in there. Uh, and his third book, what we're here to talk about today, Gallus, Scotland, England and the 1967 World Cup Final, which is about the iconic game where Scotland defeated England 3-2 to end their, was it 19 game 19 unbeaten game? 19 game unbeaten run, yes. Yeah, yep. after they won the World Cup. It's out and available now. Um, firstly, Michael, it's a pleasure having you here. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Yeah, very excited. Uh, after all this time, researching the book, writing the book, 95,000 words later, lots of edits, lots of back and forth, lots of emails, all that sort of stuff. It's finally out there for people to go and buy and read and hopefully enjoy. So yeah, this is, this is the good part. This is the fun part. Yeah, definitely. Well, the fun part for me was reading it. But before we get into the book and talk about it, we were very fortunate to get a wee private tour around mm -hmm. here. What do you think of the setting for this interview? It's absolutely spectacular, I have to say. I mean, I haven't been here before. I hadn't actually been at Edmondson House until just now. So I think it's a great facility. And it's funny, I think it's, in a weird way, it's quite easy to get something like this wrong. You can just hit all the wrong notes, yeah. but they've got it so right here. I think it's a, it's amazing. You just walk around with your, your eyes wide the whole time. There's so many little nuggets that just remind you of, of times being a Ranger supporter when you were young or, you know, like me now approaching 40. So it's, it, it just strikes all the right notes. And how can you not be inspired when you're sitting with these trophies behind you as well and all around you? So yeah, That's an amazing setup. That's it, exactly, and I'm, after playing that mini game with the balls, I'm absolutely knackered <laughs> after it. But listen, we're here to talk about your book, so uh, let's begin with the, the few years into the, the run-up at the match at Wembley in 1967, where the results, England, Scotland, somewhat mixed, yeah, you'd say, in yeah. there. Um, there was that stinging 9-3 victory uh, a good few years before it. Uh, obviously, England won the World Cup, and then there was the backdrop of the SFA sort of aligning themselves to be more like the English FA. Mm -hmm. um, they were ditching a selection committee. The national team manager was was sacked after a, a few games. Um, how much of a state of turmoil would you say that, that Scotland were going into in the lead up to this game? Definitely a bit of turmoil insofar as I think national pride had been wounded by seeing England win in the World Cup. The fact that we didn't qualify, narrowly missing out in the final match away to Italy in yeah. our qualification. That, I think, caused some upset anyway, but then seeing England win it in the circumstances that they did, it made, I think, a lot of people at the SFA sort of sit up and take notice, and particularly of the work that Alf Ramsey had been doing yeah. with the, the national team. He'd very skillfully created the, the club environment at international level, and that's so hard to do. I mean, how often do you ever get your players together? It's not like you see them every day. Yeah. So he did something fantastic there. Everybody in the team knew exactly what was expected of them. He got a bit lucky as well. No injuries, no suspensions. So he was able to pick mostly the same starting 11 over and over. Yeah. And the SFA decided, well, if it works for them, we'll have a bit of that. But the problem was the first full-time manager that they chose, John Prentice, was tapped up, if that's the right expression yeah. to use, by the uh, couple of teams in the North American Soccer League, which was just starting. And he claims with the blessing of the uh, SFA, he went out there and had some conversations with them. Yeah. Other people at the SFA said, you didn't really have our blessing. <laughs> Long story short, he got shown the door yeah. after just a few months in charge. And so that was October, September, October 1966. So England are celebrating winning the World Cup yeah. and we're back to square one. So it was a, 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 bit of, a bit of turmoil for sure. There was an interim manager chosen for Scotland at that time, Malky McDonald, who was doing great things with, with Kilmarnock and would go on to do great things with Kilmarnock that season yeah. in the Intercities Fairs Cup. But Scotland, yeah, we ended the year with no permanent manager in place and a lot of questions about where do we go next. Yeah, so you've led me perfectly on to my next question. 
You touched on Alf Ramsey. He was a character throughout the book that I found absolutely fascinating. He was a, a real winner, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. um, but the, the guy that I really want to talk to you about is, is the Scotland manager, Bobby Brown, for that game. Obviously, um, he was a successful Rangers player. He was the goalkeeper. Uh, I think he won 11 major trophies alongside being a PE teacher, <laughs> which is just something that you would never My see. My PE teacher day. wasn't that good at any sport. <laughs> so, yeah, quite amazing. Do you think we could get to have been the PE teacher or something like that at somebody's <laughs> school these days? Um, but yeah, he left St Johnson to become the Scotland manager after certainly not being the favourite for the job. Mm. How well equipped do you think he was uh, to go into that role and, and to become the Scotland manager? You're right, he wasn't the first choice. I'm not even sure he was the second or third choice. But he was doing good things at St Johnson. And I think at that time, we didn't need a huge name. We needed somebody who could galvanise a squad of players who had an, immen uh, an immense amount of talent at their disposal in the likes of Billy Bremner, Dennis Law, Jim Baxter. And then you had other guys there who were solid, dependable, you know, Eddie McCready and such like. So we needed somebody who wasn't necessarily going to walk in there with tons of swagger and claim to be the Scottish Alf Ramsey. We needed someone who could go in there and have the the sort of charisma to lead that team, but also the, the backbone to stand up to the yeah. SFA and say, I'm going to do it my way. Yeah. But at the same time as that, retreat into the shadows. So there are three things he needed to do, yeah. all of which seemed kind of counterintuitive against one another. Almost impossible to find, but he did it. So we'll, we'll move on to the game itself. A game at a packed Wembley. Law opening the scoring for Scotland with a rebound. Uh, there was then a flurry of late goals. Bobby Lennox making it 2-0 for Scotland. Jeff Hurst, obviously that name's always involved, isn't it? In these, <laughs> always is. When you're talking about these England games. Um, and Jim McCallug. McCallug, yes. McCallug, yep. I've been practising that name all day and I still <laughs> couldn't get it right. Um, it was an absolute rasper to make it 3-1. And the final goal for Jack Charlton and the game ended 3-2. Scotland became the unofficial world champions <laughs> at the time. What were some of the, the highlight moments, standout moments from, from that game? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's funny because I, I must have watched the game now a good dozen times and it's available to watch on YouTube. I highly recommend that if you have the time and inclination, go and watch it because it's so fast. I mean, it, it, it's, yeah. it's so funny because there are no lulls in play. For example, nowadays when the ball goes out for a throw in, certainly Ibrox tab runs from one side of the park to the other to take it. And, you know, you, you have like those lulls now with goal kicks where the goalkeeper has to, you know, kick his heels off the posts a number of times. None of that in that game. The ball goes out and it comes straight back in. It's Ange Postacoglu would have, it's probably his inspiration, to be honest. But it's, so there's that in terms of just how fast paced the game is. I think for me, one of the, the standouts is the fact that Dennis Law was like a man possessed in like the, the first 30 minutes. You could tell he he felt the pain of England winning the World Cup. It's funny, actually, there's a, a great little tale in there about Dennis Law. So he felt the pain of England winning the World Cup really acutely. And he actually had to go and play golf on the day of the game rather than sit there and watch it. So then, of course, he goes back and plays for Manchester United, surrounded by people who'd won it, Nobby Styles and Bobby Charlton and, and whatnot. So he was really feeling it. And he's a proud Scot anyway, so if you watch the footage, the first half hour, Dennis Law is a man possessed, trying to do anything he can to get the ball in the net. And of course, he, he opened the scoring, which was great. There's lots of other funny little moments as well. I think Jack Charlton's injury, <laughs> if you're of an English persuasion, you would say that altered the outcome of the game quite significantly because he was effectively a lame duck. There were no substitutions at that yeah. time, which seems baffling now but you would imagine that he would have come straight off after his clash with Bobby Lennox early on instead he had to go and basically sit up front and it was just a lame duck so there are lots of weird little incidents peppered throughout but the big one obviously is Baxter's keepy uppies isn't it I mean the, that's what the game's famous for if you ask most people about the Scotland England game in 1967 I am quite confident not many of them could tell you the scoreline. They know Scotland won, yeah. but they might not be able to say it was 3-2, but they will know Jim Baxter's keepy uppies. That's yeah. what it's famous for. Yeah, 100%. And getting to watch it was just incredible, wasn't it? Um, so there was an unpre unprecedented demand for tickets uh, for the game. There was no my jersey or anything like that back in those <laughs> days, so the attendance just been over 90,000. 
I found it absolutely mental to even comprehend a stadium where there's double the amount of supporters mm. than a normal day at Ibrooks. But of course, the the fans famously rushed the the pitch at the end of the game. But just from a from a modern football perspective, what would an atmosphere have been like back then compared to a game nowadays? Would it have been much different, or certainly very passionate? <laughs> um, obviously, most people would be standing as well. But I think it would just be more or less the same as we have now, just noisier and yeah, yeah just everything ramped up to eleven effectively. The old spinal I, tap. The old spinal tap, yeah. <laughs> I, I spoke to a few people who were at the game and yeah, some of their stories are great, but they, they just describe it as being, well, that was the norm for us back then to yeah. be surrounded by ninety odd thousand people. So I often I look back at it now and I wish I'd spent more time with them to say, Well, you go to games these days, what's it like being in a stadium that's half as full as that. Yeah. So but I mean you get you get ninety thousand very, very passionate fans there. The, the, the interesting thing is that it, according to a lot of the players on both sides, it felt like there were more Scots there than English yeah. supporters. So maybe there's something in that. Maybe there were, maybe the English fans were just a bit more quiet. I don't know, but it's it's funny when you listen back to it, you can hear a lot of Scottish singing and you know yeah. all the famous Scottish anthems that are, that are being sung. So yeah, just a, an amazing spectacle to look at as well to see that many fans in such yeah. a small space. Yeah, so we've already talked about the, the Scotland manager, our next Rangers goalkeeper, Bobby Brown. The next part of the interview I would like to talk about is, is focus a wee bit more on, on Rangers, seeing as uh -huh. we are here, it'd be of course. remiss of me not to do so. Um, so we sit here in the, the magnificent new Rangers Museum. We round the corner from us, there's the, the World Eleven shirt from, from mm -hmm. Jim Baxter, Slim Jim. Um, I couldn't believe the condition that it was in, yeah. how amazing it looked, all the caps. But um, yeah, so what what was Jim Baxter's contribution to that game? You already touched a bit on it, but how important and integral was, was he to that, that team? Well, the funny thing is that his place was very much in doubt leading into the match. He'd been in pretty indifferent form, and that's true for a lot of Baxter's career. I think we, yeah. we kind of mythologise people like Baxter and so on, and we forget that they had slumps. You know, there were times when they weren't playing to their best. Mm -hmm. Their best was exceptional, but the standards came and went. Mm -hmm. And yeah, certainly at that time, he wasn't playing especially well. And there was some speculation, certainly in the Scottish media, that he wouldn't be picked. There was also a real feeling among some in Scottish media that the side should be comprised solely of Scottish-based players. Yeah. Leave out the so-called Anglos, which means you're leaving out Baxter, who was at Sunderland. It means leaving out Billy Bremner. I mean, how do you leave out Billy Bremner? <laughs> yeah. Dennis Law, who would yeah. have walked into that England team, in my opinion. So yeah, Baxter in particular, his place was very much in the, in doubt. But I think he showed the commitment that he had to the team and certainly to, to that match, mm -hmm. to righting a wrong, if that's what it was for Scotland, when the previous weekend he came up and did private training with, I think it was Walter McRae, one of uh, Bobby Brown's assistants and they went to rugby park and they just did one-on-one -on -one training for the entire day and yeah. basically proved you know what i'm i'm ready i'm fit and i really want to play in this game so on reflection it's probably just as well he did because yeah. he was metronomic in, in the match yeah just total composure as far as i can remember he i can't really recall him misplacing too many passes and just dictated the tempo of the play from a, a, a deeper position than I think most people would expect him to occupy. Yeah. He was just, he was pulling all the strings. Yeah, he was, he was the big player for, for the big game, but out of everyone in the book, I certainly found that he seemed to have the most amount of stories that, mm -hmm. and <laughs> lots of tales. Is there any that, that stood out to you? Is there any particular favourites you've got? Oh yeah, I mean... <laughs> Trying to pick your, your favourite Jim Baxter story is like trying to pick your favourite Ranger of all time or your favourite <laughs> Ranger shirt. I mean, there are so many to choose from. I, I still find it quite funny that on the day that he signed his contract with the club, having moved from Wraith Rovers, he signed the contract in the morning and then within a couple of hours was out shopping for a brand new Jaguar. <laughs> Not because he wanted to show off or anything like that, because he thought, I'm, I'm big time Jim. It was to impress the girls, you know. Yeah, that's, yeah. He thought, well, I'm now a Rangers player, so I might as well drive a car that's going to attract all the ladies. Yeah. Um, he, uh, the, the, the stories about his, his off the field persuasions are well known. 
Um, we, we know about the battles that he's faced and the, the tragic consequences of that. <laughs> so yeah, you like to drink, yeah. but it's, it's quite funny when you look at this one, but his favourite watering hole, I gather, was the St. Enoch Hotel. And he would go there regularly before games, after games, before training, after training. And he started to just sign a tab away to the club. Like, just, <laughs> right, I, I drank that much, send the tab back to the club. And for the most part, I think they just put up with it. I don't know if there was an agreement in place that, all right, Jim, fine, we'll cover it up to a certain amount or, or what the, the deal was. But he got away with it for a while. Then the club cottoned on, said, right, no more charging drink back to us, Jim. <laughs> yeah. So instead, to get round that, he started forging the signature of his teammates. <laughs> and it was only rumbled when Davy Wilson got called in by the management and said, look, you've, you've just signed this amount away from the hotel. Yeah. You're going to have to cover that. And Wilson goes, well, couldn't have been me. I'm like, what do you mean it couldn't have been you? He says, well, I'm teetotal. <laughs> so how could it have been? Yeah. So, yeah, Baxter got up to all sorts. Uh, I, I, wish, I wish I'd written the book 20, 25 years ago, so I could have spoken to him about it and you really got his memories. We've been able to cobble together some, but yeah, what a, a, a total one-off. And he sums himself up really well in his own book when he said that everything he did was spontaneous. It was off the cuff. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just tons of personality and tons of talent, isn't it? So Jim Baxter, he finishes Rangers career with three league titles, three Scottish Cups and three League Cups. He was good enough to be selected for, for the World Eleven. Mm -hmm. He was playing alongside players like French... Ferenc Puskas, Lev Yashin, eh, Alfredo De Stefano, and obviously he's really, really fondly remembered by Ranger supporters. Where would you rate Jim Baxter? And I know this is a difficult <laughs> question in the sort of echelons of, of Scottish uh, football and, and, and the history of Rangers as well. In terms of sheer talent, he's right up there, isn't he? I mean, the fact that we're still talking about him today, that tells you that he was special, that he was different, and that yeah. first and foremost, he was divinely talented with the greatest of respect to the other guys that were in that Rangers squad at the same time as he was the early 60s name five of them you <laughs> yeah. know unless you're a real die-hard Rangers fan as I'm sure some people listening and watching this will be yeah it's back so that stands out you remember the greats because they're great I know that sounds really obvious but you do you remember the best players because of the best players I grew up idolizing Brian Loudrup you know yeah. I could probably tell you six or seven of the guys that he played alongside, but if I, I would have to think long and hard about it. Yeah. So to answer your question, where does Jim Baxter fit? I think he would absolutely walk into a greatest Rangers 11. Yeah. And I think that he would have a really, really good case of being in a greatest Scottish 11 as well. Yeah, I think that's that's an excellent answer to that question. I think on, on talent, he is, he is one of the best that this country's ever produced. But speaking of greats as well the next uh, player I want to talk about is the greatest ever ranger and that's John Gregg mm -hmm. how much do you think obviously he was captain for that game how much do you think his um, time as captain at Rangers um, and how much did that affect the so I'll start that again as well move on to the the greatest ever ranger now and John Gregg obviously he was captain of the the squad that defeated England in 1967 how much do you think an influence of his time as, as Rangers captain did that have on, on that Scotland squad? Massive. You know, he was, as, as you say, he was the captain of the, the team in that match. And look at the players that he was captain. You know, Dennis Law, Jim Baxter, Billy Bremner. I mean, any one of them potentially could have been the, the Scotland captain on that day. But I know they'd experimented with having different players as captain in the, the years leading up to that match. But the way I always think about it is... Jock Steen, when he was a Scotland manager, late 60s, uh, sorry, late 65, he made John Craig his Scotland captain. Now, what does that tell you when yeah. you're surrounded by the likes of Billy McNeil and so on? Yeah. I think everybody knew and understood what John Craig brought to the, the team, brought to the dressing room, brought to the environment. He is absolutely the greatest Ranger ever, in my opinion, and just a, a natural leader. I can't think of anyone that you would rather have had leaders out there against England on that day. Uh, a wee extra about the, the book that I really enjoyed, Michael, was, was the appendices at the back. I could sit <laughs> and genuinely read all that stuff all day. Um, you obviously put loads and loads of research into the book. I imagine that you've seen stuff 
that nobody else has seen, mm -hmm. stuff that nobody's seen in years. And obviously you were fortunate enough to, to talk to some of the, the surviving members of the squad. As I say, I wish I'd done it years and years ago when more of the players on both sides were still alive. Uh, I would have liked to have had the opportunity to explore the English side a little bit more, but there were only three players alive when I started writing the book. There's only two now. Uh, one of them, Bobby Charlton's not very well. And it's a similar deal on the Scotland side. You know, Bobby Lennox isn't, you know, as far as I'm aware, doesn't like to do too much in public these days. He stepped back, uh, has some of his, his own battles, I believe. Uh, Dennis Law's health has been well documented. So I'd have loved to have speak, spoken to more of them, mm. but you, you, you can't turn back time, obviously. Jim McCallig, though, I'm so grateful for his hospitality. He lives just in the outskirts of Glasgow. Obviously the match winner as well. <laughs> and a lovely, lovely man who had a really underrated career played pretty much exclusively in England, you know, and he played alongside some great players, you know, at Chelsea, Ron Chopper Harris, Terry Venables, uh, George Graham, he was managed by Don Reavy, he was managed by Tommy Doherty, and then obviously goes to, to Sheffield Wednesday and did really well there too. So he's a wonderful man and it was, it was strange actually because we were having a really good conversation about the match and he remembers everything so clearly, so vividly. And I asked him to, to describe the goal that he scored in as much detail as he possibly could. And he spoke for about 10 minutes without coming up for air. And then he just sort of paused and his eyes filled up and his voice trembled. And you could just tell even now, like 55 years later, 56, just how much it meant to him to, to score and to, to play yeah. in that game. The emotion was so vivid and raw. But on his wall, he's also got a, a picture of him with Dennis Law shaking hands earlier in the week because Sheffield Wednesday had played Manchester United midweek. <laughs> so the squad had been announced by that point and McCallie shakes hands with Dennis Law. They had their picture taken and he's got the, the picture on his wall framed, signed by Dennis Law. Oh. And uh, it's just, you, you look at that and the hairs in the back of your neck stand up. It's, it's an amazing bit of memorabilia from a, a match that means so much to so many people. Yeah, and listen, I think that's a really great place to, to end today's very, very insightful interview, Michael. Um, it's one of the most important, if not the most important game, arguably, in Scottish football in history. I got to say, really well done in the book. It really Thank was you. a fantastic read. I am not a massive reader, but I could not put it down at points. Um, if you just want to tell everybody watching and listening, where can they grab it from? Yeah, sure. So it's on sale now from all good bookshops, some bad ones as well, I'm sure. <laughs> and it's online. You can get it from Polaris Publishing, who have uh, published the book. Obviously, Amazon as well, if you want to go there. And you're quite right. I mean, it's it's you look back, that game in 67, that's, that's probably the biggest and single the single most important match in Scottish football history. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, I'm so excited for the opportunity when we stop talking about it <laughs> yeah. and when we have something else to celebrate. I feel like the, the squad of players that we've got just now are, are capable of, of pushing us on and whatever the next success is, presumably qualifying out of the group stages of a major international tournament, that's got to be the next step. Yeah. So I'm excited for people to go out and read the book. I'm excited for the point when we stop talking about 67 and, and that team. But hopefully in a couple of months when we've sold a few copies. <laughs> yeah, be yeah, definitely. But listen, thanks for coming down here today for giving this interview for, for this is Ibrooks. On it, it has been a real pleasure genuinely talking to you and taking all this stuff in this museum. Uh, I've got to say a huge thank you to the guys at Podcast podcast studio glasgow thanks cammy thanks mark um and a massive thank you for the club for allowing us to mm. film in this amazing location if you've not been down here guys come down and check it out because it really is phenomenal and finally thanks to you guys watching and listening there so take care